The title is a bit um, scary. Um, there's, a, there's a mathematical paper which I won't be presenting, but, but there's a model behind it, and I wanted to, uh, this is the title of the model. Um, right, so what are the key messages I want to carry on today? Um, the first one is that um, the, low carbon ec the, the transition to a low carbon economy has to be a social transition as well, or you won't have a, a transition to a low carbon economy. And I don't have to say this in France. I mean, this is the good thing about being living in the current times. There's a lot of um, turmoil coming out of the, the very fact that we started to have a transition to a low carbon economy. The second point um, I want to make is that every transition will imply imbalances and tensions. It's every m technological revolution that we have observed in the past has always led to ba imbalances and, tens and tensions, and this one is no different. Um, but the fact that we have a transition to a low carbon economy, and there's an in the context of climate change, I'll just skip for two minutes, have a seat. Sorry. No, no, no worries. There's there, and you can take my chair if you want. No, no worries. Right. Let me just restart the, the three key messages I want to carry on tonight, <laughs> today. Tonight? This is already like, ah, oh, it feels so long. <laughs> right. Um, so the transition to a low carbon economy will also be a social transition or it won't be. The second key message is that every transition will imply imbalances and tension. Um, but a transition to a low carbon in the context of climate change will see these tensions and balances exacerbated. All right? So you're going to have more than the, tra the traditional transition. If you think about the emergence of the, um, the dot net or the emergence of the steel and so on, these were carrying tensions, social destruction, uh, creative destruction and so on and so forth. But on top of it, we are living in a context where climate change is happening and you have tensions already happening. And so the, the two of them combined is actually very uh, worrisome. And the third point, which this is the, the a bit, a bit um, to a less, lesser extent, but modeling is there to create a debate. So, so it highlights dynamics, it shows constraint, it shows fragility, but it should not be seen as, as normative. It shouldn't say, this is how we will do it, this is how the economy works. It actually is descriptive. You, can't, you, it's, it, you, you really have just to highlight stuff, but you can't say this is how it should work. All right? But this is because I'm going to do a bit of modeling, and so I want you to take a step uh, aside and just, just not take it as granted. Right, so um, the, 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 the outline, I'll, I'll talk a bit uh, about climate change and the transition. Um, I'm getting the idea that you have a bit of knowledge about climate, but I'll, I'll go a bit deeper, so I'll highlight this. I'll talk about class struggle and, and social tensions in economic modeling. I'll present them the model that I presented, um, a bit of results, and then we'll talk, this is the last point which I find the most interesting, um, what, how do we talk about the acceptance to a low carbon transition in this context? Right, um, these are the RCPs, meet the RCPs. Okay, so how many of you know about RCPs? Okay, well, Stan cheats and, and Louis as well. <laughs> All right, so RCPs are the climatic scenarios, right? When the IPCC says, okay, well, we're going to go into a two-degree world or a four-degree world or a six-degree world, it's based on these climatic scenarios. So these are scenarios. So first, these are like thought experiment, yeah? What would happen if we were to have this kind of emissions over the next 50, 100 years, okay? And these emissions then translate into temperature anomalies, increase in temperature with respect to the pre-industrial temperature. Okay, pre-industrial temperature is, is uh, 1800, 1870 or something like that. Okay, so we look at how the emissions have led to an increase in temperature with respect to the average temperature that happened in, on Earth in 1870. Okay, and so you have um, four scenarios, uh, the RCP 2.6, which is the, like, like the dream world, which so allegedly, you get back towards uh, zero emissions and your temperature increases between 0 0.9 and 2.3. This is what we would <coughs> like to have. <coughs> then you have RCP uh, 4.5, which sees an increase in emissions, but at some point you go back and you, you, lead, you, you go towards uh, uh, no emissions, uh, uh, no increase in emissions, and this leads to 1.7, 3.2 degrees increase. Then you have RCP, point, uh, RCP 6, which is a bit more scary. 
there's a, there's a, there's a slight increase in, in emissions and a, a very low decrease in the end. 2 degrees, 3.7 degrees. And then there's a scary one. And this was, and I, and I mean it, when the IPCC was designing this scenario, they said, we're going to take the worst case scenario, right? This is just like nothing happens, we keep on emitting and so on and so forth. And this was like, like don't do it, this is, this is the scary one. RCP 8.5, which leads to 3.2, 5.4, and look at where we are, right? They were designed in the, in the early 2000s, and we are there. So the scary scenario, which was meant to be like, oh, this is the monster, don't go there, is actually the business as usual, right? Okay, how does this then translate into impacts on Earth? Because this is just a temperature, average temperature in increase. I mean, if you live in the north, a bit, a few more degrees, that's okay. You live. So what we do here, I just, I'll just give you a very quick uh, overview of different impacts that we can uh, uh, observe. Um, these are done by very serious people, climatologists and so on. I'm, I'm completely unable to replicate this. But so this is something which looks at the average daily temperature and the average relative humidity. Okay, so so. When you talk about heat waves, it's actually the combination of, of temperature and humidity that makes it uh, uh, dangerous for you. All right, so only heat, dry heat is not so bad, or very humid cold, it's not so bad, but the combination of heat and humidity makes it dangerous for the, for the health. And so what these guys did was they were looking at these combination of daily temperature and daily, uh, daily humidity and looked at the impact of death, increase in death rates. Right? And these all points are a bunch of different observations on Earth of combination of temperature and humidity. And then they, they, they use support vector machines, which is uh, artificial intelligence, to determine what is the combination of heat and humidity that leads to increase in death rates. Right? And so they look at this and they, they, they define the blue line is, is uh, the regressor, this is a 95% regressor, so when they want to be more sure about the combination. And what they look is, these are the climatic scenarios, and they say, <coughs> this is what we observed in the past, this is the, the, their uh, regressor, and they then, do regress they, they, they then do look at, okay, what happens afterwards. And what you see is that the global human population, the sorry, the share of global human population, which is confronted to a combination of daily temperature and daily humidity, which is such that it will lead to increase in death rates, is going to increase. So, so up to 2000s, 40% were exposed to at least one case where you had the combination of, of well, the heat wave. Okay, but as you as you go with time, it goes with the RCP 8.5, the scary one, which is the one we are, are currently living on. It's going to go up to 80% by 2100. So what we see is that the percentage of the population which is going to be exposed to heat waves, deadly heat waves is going to increase dramatically with climate change. I haven't shown this, but the paper shows that, of course, location is important, right? Again, if you live in the north or if you live in the, in the in tropics, it's going to be different. And of course, most of the population which is going to be impacted lives on the tropical areas, all right? Second uh, analysis is on impact on labor productivity. Um, this is um, a work where you, the, the American army has uh, designed a, a combination of what they call wet bulb temperature. So it's again a, con a combination of temperature and humidity under which you are able to perfectly work. And if you go above a certain level, then you should decrease your working ability so as not to suffer from health issues, okay? And so, um, and they say, okay, well, if you go above this web of temperature, then, then you should go to 80% and so on and so forth, okay? So these are, this is assuming that everyone is a GI, okay? And again, you have um, the, the, the average labor capacity, so how much people on average on Earth is working, yeah? What's a GI? Um, American soldier, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> you haven't played with GI Joes when you were a kid? Nah, okay. <laughs> you're way too young for that. <laughs> All right, uh, <laughs> um, Navy SEALs, doesn't matter. All right, so, so you have the, the historical trend of, of uh, how much people were supposed to decrease the labor capacity or, or, or downsize their, their workforce to 90%. Uh, then you have the black line, which is the, 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 the line where they, they show the, 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 sorry, they validate the model on sample. And then in blue and, and, and red, you have the RCP 8.5 and the RCP 
2.5, uh, I never remember the, the digit afterwards. And what you see is again, uh, by 2100, on average, uh, population will have to decrease by 40% their labor capacity. So 60% only of the potential labor capacity. And it goes even worse afterwards. Uh, in the case of, two of the, the two degree scenario, it's actually not so bad. You, get, you stay at around 80%. There's a decrease, but not so strong. Right, so what we have seen in the first case, people were, will be impacted by heat waves and their risk of um, deadly heat waves. Second case is, it's going to be more complicated to work outside. Right, and, and, and uh, the American army recommends you to decrease your work capacity if you work outside in, in the weather uh, temperature. And again here, you will see this mostly in the tropics. Um, third one, and if you're not completely depressed by the end of my presentation, that means I haven't done a good job. <laughs> All right. So um, these are the countries uh, where you have lots of population living in, in these low elevation coastal zones. Right. So the, the, the coastal zones which, which are subject to be uh, uh, impacted by increase in, in uh, sea level. Right. And so uh, you have a different, different uh, scale, but basically most of these countries uh, have between one, uh, one million people uh, up to 200, people, 2000 mi 200 million people sorry, uh, in China. Um, and then you have the, the mega cities, the mega poles, right? Um, which are <coughs> about an 8 million people in tw 2010 and in 2025. Uh, so what you see is that there's a lot of people living close by the, the low region, the low um, elevation coastal zones, um, and large cities uh, are living in zones where they could be impacted by the increase in sea level. And this is the impact. Um, so in 20, this is in uh, um, the increase um, between 1986 and 2081 uh, and one, 2100. And you see that you can have increases up to a meter by 2100 under the RCP 8.5, right? So all these cities that are in low economy coastal zones, low elevations coastal zones, sorry, uh, will be impacted by the sea level rise. Last point, um, these are the jobs relying on ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are all that nature provides. Water purification, uh, bees uh, doing um, uh, pollinization, sorry. Um, you have pure air. So all of these services that nature is providing, all right? And as you can easily understand, there's a lot of jobs depending on that, right? So if you think about uh, fishers, they depend on fish. If you have no fish, then you can't be a fisher. Um, but there's a lot of other jobs like that. So the ILO in 2018, which is a very nice report, I highly recommend reading it, uh, has shown, uh, has done a, a survey of all the different jobs that were heavily depend, directly depends, or heavily depend on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And if you look at that, there's basically 1.2 billion jobs which depend on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And biodiversity is heavily impacted by climate change. So again, these jobs are at threat of being destroyed as climate change evolves and biodiversity di disappears. Right, now a bit of a, yeah. Uh, I thought you was gonna say that these kind of jobs are gonna increase as there are more needs in no, so these are, these are not what we call green jobs. These are the jobs that depend on it. So, oh. so that, that if you don't have the ecosystem services, then the job is threatened. Okay. So it's excluding the jobs? No, uh, there might be. Some of preserving the environment. There might be, actually. Uh, I'd have to check that. No, I think these are the jobs that directly depend. It's not, it's not the jobs that are aimed to, to, pre uh, to, to preserve nature and, and, and the environment. But I'll come to that in a moment, because, because there is an impact on that. Yeah. So um, this is an interesting graph because it combines the ecological footprint, which you all know, right? The impact of uh, each country on average per capita on Earth. It's uh, it's it's critical in itself. You, you can discuss about whether it makes sense to, to 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 use foot ecological footprint, but anyway, it's an interesting indicator. And then you have the human development indica index, right? So human development index again. There's a lot of critiques that can be uh, expressed uh, uh, with it. What is interesting here is that if you take human development index as an idea of um, social sustainability or, or human development, and if you take the ecological, fo ecological footprint as an index of 
um, the, the environmental sustainability, what you want to be is you want to be as much on the right hand side, right? You want to be as developed as possible and as much as the low hand side, uh, as on the lower part, right? So you want to be as much uh, uh, sustainable as possible. There's actually two lines here, uh, two vertical lines and two horizontal lines. The vertical lines are 0.7, which is uh, the high human development, and, and here uh, 0.8, which roughly, which is very high human development. This is Russia, to give you an idea. And then you have here two, uh, two limits, which is the world biocapacity in 1961. So that's uh, how much Earth was allowing, like if everyone was, was to have the same impact, this is how, uh, how much you could, you, uh, Earth was able, uh, was able to, to sustain. And this is in 2012, so, so there's a decrease already. So this square here is the magic, magic square where you want to be, right? You want to have this high development index and you want to have a low ecological footprint. And of course, there's no one in here. What is interesting here is that what you see is all of these countries which are on the left-hand side, they actually need to develop and to go towards high development. And all the countries which are here, which have high development, they need to move down and to have a sustainable position. This is to say the transition is for everyone, right? There's no such thing as saying, well, you guys need to do or no. This is everyone, and that's why it's interesting. The transition is actually something very uh, holistic. You can't just say, pinpoint and say, no, everyone has to move and everyone has to go to the magic square. All right? This is Carlota Perez. Uh, those who know me actually know that I like her a lot. Um, Carlota Perez has uh, worked, I mean, if you were in the innovation uh, path, you, you've heard about her. And if you haven't, that means you haven't listened to your, le to, to your lecture. Um, Carlota is, is basically um, um, theorizing the idea of innovation and, and the emergence of radical innovations. And I'm, I'm just going to go very quickly about, uh, around this, but, but she just says, okay, whenever you have a radical innovation, you have a phase where um, uh, productive capital, which is changing, you have a new way of producing, uh, is, is bringing new insights and bring new uh, productivity gains. And this is leading to financial capital to say, hey, this is interesting. Uh, there's new uh, returns there. Uh, we'll invest in there. And as financial capital is investing in this new productive capital, it creates uh, what, what uh, uh, Carlota Perez called a love affair between financial capital and productive capital. However, financial capital being footloose and extremely volatile <coughs> and being led by, by these uh, capital gains will s have a higher growth than the one granted by productive capital. So you have this decoupling between financial capital and productive, productive capital, which leads, to, according to Carlota Perez, to a bubble. So it's a boom and bust bubble, and then after the, the bust, uh, you have a synergy, and so financial capital is supposed to be regulated, and every, everything goes back to, to, to um, normal times. The reason I'm talking about this is because, again, as I said, we've seen everyone needs to move, everyone needs to actually do a transition, so that means everyone has to change the way in which they produce, consume, live. This implies that you're going to have this time of idea where productive capital will have to change, and if productive capital is changing, if these sectors are growing, financial capital will have an impact. And so you will have, it's likely to observe financial tensions emerging out of the transition to a low carbon economy. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, sorry, I didn't talk about uh, the green jobs, um, but I, I forgot, uh, there should be a slide here. Um, alongside you have this transition path, sectors are disappearing and sectors are appearing, right? So in the case of steel, uh, or in the case of trains, um, uh, horse uh, driving was disappearing, okay? In the case of the low carbon economy, there's a chance that, that coal factories will have to close down and you're gonna have other sectors emerging. What is interesting is that it looks like the transition to a low carbon economy is actually <coughs> more labor intensive than, than not. So this implies that they will, it's likely to observe an increase in job creation, at least in some sectors. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone wants to be a nature environmentalist or that everyone wants to, to, to build windmills. And of course, this will create tensions again. Right? So, so the tensions we were, we were, I was mentioning regarding financial capital and, and this idea of boom and bust dynamics, you'll also observe it in the, in the, in the labor market. 
where some sector will disappear and others will appear. Okay? In, in overall, it looks like there will be more job created, but it's not definite. Right. So, um, when you talk about economics and climate, uh, what, what you see is first uh, climate change is going to have damages on the economy, right? I, if this is the, the whole deal of the presentation up to now. Um, there, uh, there will be uh, extreme events, sorry. Um, and this is the rationale usually for economics, right? So the idea is you want to invest in less productive activities because you know that in the future you won't have the damage, right? So you do this cost-benefit analysis. Currently, if I, if I reallocate my means of production towards low-carbon production, that means in the future I will live happily. If I don't, I have higher growth now, but in the future I'll be impacted more by climate change, right? Very simple cost-benefit analysis. However, climate change already exists, first, and we are already feeding the, the impacts. And, and second, the transition is a socioeconomic restructuration. It's transformative, mm -hmm. right? It's not only about reallocating means of production. It's actually changing the way in which we live, which is extremely prone to create tensions, and it's difficult. I mean, this, what, when did we start talking about climate change, 1972? There is a reason why we didn't do something. It's not because people are dumb. It's just because it's difficult to actually get into, into that kind of transitions. So it is very likely to observe social tensions, which will, uh, which will threaten the, the, the very existence of a transition. All right? And I believe that labor market and employment fluctuation will capture these tensions, right? You will have tensions elsewhere, but I think it's going to be very pregnant, uh, uh, sorry, very, um, very clear in the labor market. Because the labor market is where these tensions, th this is where you, you observe the structural change of the production process. So this is why I think it's important to be able to capture these social tensions and this class struggle. And the connection is directly. Good, we 1967. All right, so. There's going to be a bit of math. It shouldn't be too difficult, but, but slow me down if, if I go too fast. All right, so Goodwin, 1967, is a Marxist, and he writes down this class struggle model, right? And the idea, it's a very simple model. The idea is you have two dynamics. On the first hand, you have wage bargaining, the, Phillips, the traditional Phillips curve, which says the increase in the wage share depends on the employment level, right? So if you have high employment, trade unions are strong, Labor, uh, employee, employees are strong, they can ask for higher wage, this pushes the wage share up. On the other hand, it goes the, uh, it goes the other way around. And then there's employment dynamics, which basically captures the idea if the wage share is high, that means the profit share is low, that means there's less investment. If there is less investment, there's less employment. Right? So you have two dynamics, very simple, higher wage share, uh, uh, sorry, higher employment, higher wage share, higher wage share, lower employment. And so the, the model just has these, these two imbalances, okay? Very, very simple model. Why is it interesting? It's interesting because it has a mathematical steady state which says this is the, this is, if we were to, s to be on this position, the economy would be able to reproduce itself again and again, okay? So if we are in the solution, there is the solution on the top uh, right hand. Um, if we are here in economic sense, then the economy is in a steady state and can grow forever. This is the typical uh, mainstream uh, macro, right? You are here, rock on. However, if you don't start exactly from that steady state, so this is a steady state. If you, if you start here or there or there or there, you will cycle around the steady state. You will have phases where employment will increase, wage share will increase, wage share increases, that means employment is lower, employment gets lower, then you have wage share decreasing, and you go around and around and around, and you never reach the steady state. Okay? And so you have always imbalances. Remember here, these equations are very simple. They just say, I want to be at lambda zero. If I'm at lambda zero, then the wage share doesn't change. Uh, and the same goes here, you can reformulate this. Right, so there is this optimum, which is, this is the wage share and everyone is happy, this is the employment rate, everyone is happy. However, we're never in this position, and you always have these imbalances pushing the economy around and having boom and bust dynamics. That's extremely interesting, and it's two dimension, right? No need to fancy mathematics. 
So we, we take this start, but of course there's lots of limits to, to Goodwin. Um, so Keen, Steve Keen introduces uh, uh, debt feedback into this dynamic. So he introduces a, a third dynamic which says, well, firms might need to have debt in order to invest. If you have too much debt, that reduces your profit rate. If you have less profit, then you want to invest less, right? So you have a third dynamics and a third tension emerging in the market, in, in, emerging in the model. Um, and he shows that debt can be destabilizing, and it's the I mean, you, you know Steve Keen, I, I don't know if you know Steve Keen, but Steve Keen has written a lot about how the impact of debt on, 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 on economy. And then my, my, my colleagues uh, wrote a paper where they, uh, they take this, the, the goodwin Keen model and add climate on this. And they say, well, now you have a fourth, di a fourth dimension, a fourth imbalance, which is climate change. If you produce too much, too much emissions, too few, uh, uh, too much climate uh, damage. In the long run, you, we're all dead, right? And so, so they show that that climate change increases instability. So, Steve Steve Keen had already instability, but but uh, uh, et al increase instability by adding climate change. And the second analysis they show that carbon price is interesting but not sufficient. The reason being that if you really want to have an impact carbon price has to be extremely high. If the carbon price is extremely high, you have financial instability. And so you might not be in a situation where you are in a steady state. Okay? Now, there are some issues with uh, the Goodwin-Kin model. One of them, basically, is it's given by the supply side nature of it, right? So in the Goodwin and the Goodwin-Kin model, everything that can be produced is produced. Investment is decided and consumption is just residual. It just absorbs whatever happens. If you do this and you put this in a, in a, in a, in a, a rigorous accounting framework, you end up with some weird stuff. I'm just going to show this quickly. What's the time? I have plenty of time. Good. Right. So um, this is the, the GDP in this very simple model. You have workers' uh, consumption, you have bankers' consumption, and you have investment. Um, and then uh, investment is given by uh, all the return earnings, the profit uh, plus debt. Uh, consumption is given by uh, the wage share. So you will have, if you take back this equation, uh, this is the wage share, this is the investment, this is the consumption of worker, of bankers. It's equal to GDP. Okay, so far so good. Right, um, and then you can also look at the income as uh, GDP as uh, the share, uh, the wage share plus the profit plus the profit of bankers. This is GDP from the income side. All right, so you have GDP here from the expenditure side. You have here GDP from the income side, and they have to be equal. So when you, when you simplify everything, you end up with this equality, which is the consumption of bankers is equal to their interests, the interest they get, sure, minus the debt creation. Um, if you want consumption of bankers to be always zero or larger, that implies that the interest rate has always to be larger or equal to the growth of debt, which is weird because I, let's say, is 3%, that implies you can't have more than 3% of debt, which implies that you don't have really what we call endogenous money creation, right? So, so the consumption of bankers is constraining the quantity of debt that can be created in the economy. Or, if you want to have infinite debt, as, as Steve has it, then you might, have, you might need to have negative consumption of bankers. In any case, there's a weird accounting issue there. Um, so what we want to do is we identify the problem with the fact that the issue there is related to the idea of the supply-driven uh, supply nature of the model. So we want to introduce demand. We want to say, well, demand is independent of supply, and you might have excess demand or excess supply. And in that case, you have to have feedbacks. And of course, we're not the first one to think so. Um, and there's, a pl there's plenty of uh, uh, models. Uh, the problem with most of these models is that because you want to do analytical work, you need to keep the dimension of the model very low, right? You can't have many different stuff. But when you have independent demand, it's very easy to have to add six, seven, eight, nine, ten dimensions. And when you have a model with six, seven, eight, nine, ten dimensions, it's impossible to do analytical work. So um, they run into some issues. Most of the times is the fact that they don't have inventories. So what happens is if you have excess demand, no, sorry, excess supply, 
you have to have something that, that clears the market, right? You always have to have demand equal to supply. But if supply is larger than demand, what happens in real life, you have inventories. Firms don't sell, they pile up inventories. And then they decide to reduce supply. That means you have to account for inventories in your model, but that adds dimension in the model. I'm losing you guys now. Eh, okay, I'll keep on going. The problem is that adding these inventories changes the way in which you compute profits. And you always end up with this weird accounting issue, which is they usually account for the fact that profit is equal to the profit share times production. But actually, if you do the math, profit is equal to aggregate demand, that is how much you sell, minus how much you it costs you to produce. So you can't say that this is production, this is demand. So you can't say that the profit is equal to the profit share times production. Because this is, this is based on demand, but this is based, well, the wage bill is based on production. So if you have a, 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 a misalignment between demand and production, your profit share, you, you can't multiply the profit share by production because this is demand. Anyway, simple accounting. So you have an issue with accounting. So what we did is we started to think more carefully about how do we do a demand model. And this is the demand model. <coughs> this is the transaction flow matrix. So it highlights every transaction that we have in our economy. Minus implies it's an expenditure, plus implies it's an income. Okay, outflow, inflow. And if your accounting is right, you have to have that all outflow have an inflow. So every expenditure is explained by an income, or every income is explained by an expenditure. Otherwise, you have an accounting issue. Right, so you have consumption. And in our case, we quickly realized that we had three types of uh, households. Workers, entrepreneurs, these are the guys that are managing the firms, and then the bankers. So three types of workers, uh, three types of households, which are all consuming. The consumption is the recipient for the firms. We distinguish between the current account and the capital account. So the current account for a firm is all the inflow that happened in the current period. The capital account is how you finance your investment, okay? So the firms are investing, it's an income on the current account side, but it's an expenditure for the capital account, right? Still equal to zero. And then, this is what we were missing in the first place, inventory accumulation, okay? Again, it's an income for the firms on the current account, but it's an expenditure for the capital. If you want, this is undesired investment, right? Investment building up is basically you investing in future sales. It doesn't produce more, but, but you can still perceive it as an investment. And so the, the, the items with the square brackets are memo items. This is GDP. Consumption plus investment is GDP. Okay? Then you have those, this is above is GDP from the, from the expenditure side and then GDP from the income side. You have wages being distributed from the firms to the workers and then you have uh, profits, well, sorry, uh, interest payments being paid by firms to the banks. And this part here, so GDP minus wage minus uh, uh, interest is equal to the profits of firms, okay? Then these profits can be either distributed as dividends to entrepreneurs, so firms to entrepreneurs and banks to bankers, or they can be returned to finance investment. And in the end, all of these equal to zero, but then you have what we call the net net position, which is the savings of all the different sectors. So the income of workers, that is the wage bill minus the consumption, is equal to the savings the income of entrepreneurs minus the consumption and so on and so forth. So you have the net living position of all the different sectors. And once you have this, they have, you have to explain what do you do with your savings or with your net savings. So you can either invest in deposits and that's why we have a minus here. So this is the fact that households are saving. They are spending to buy deposits. So they can buy deposits, which is a outflow 
for the banks and or sorry a liability for the banks and then you can have whatever investment is not being financed by return earnings is being financed by debt and you have it here okay fairly simple model what are the assumption because I, I I'm not going to show you any any I'm going to skip directly to the 5d system so I'm not going to explain all the equations I'm sorry for your uh, colleagues they, that had to go through and then had their eye bleed <laughs> of blood um, all right so what we assume in this simple model is that we don't we assume that entrepreneurs and bankers don't consume that's a very strong assumption but it just simplifies a lot we are working on a version where we have consumption uh, for entrepreneurs and bankers but so not so it's only workers that are consuming, they consume all their wages, so they don't save. Okay, so this is zero. On the other hand, uh, entrepreneurs and bankers are saving everything in terms of money. Okay, they don't consume, they have an income, it saves. Um, we assume that um, firms decide how much to produce based on relative process, so they look at how much they sold in the last period, and then they adapt, and they say, okay, I'm going to increase my, my production if I sold more than what I produced last period, if I haven't produced uh, as, uh, if I haven't sold as much as I wanted to, I'm going to decrease my production. Very simple adaptive process. Um, I'm assuming that the wage uh, negotiation is following the Phillips curve, so when you have high employment or high capacity utilization, so the idea is that there's an insider and outsider effect in the Phillips curve. The insider effect is I look at how much my firm produce, and that says, well, if you produce a lot, that means you have a lot of income, that means I can get more. And then you have an outsider effect, which is employment is high in the economy or is low in the economy, i.e. I can increase my wages because the overall economy is going well. Okay, insider-outsider effect. Um, and then it's a nominal wage um, uh, negotiation, so you look also at inflation. All right? Uh, up, investment depends on capacity utilization, depends on the profit you make, and depends on the debt level you have. Uh, what else? Ah, oh, prices. Prices have two components. There's a cost push element, which is if wages are high, price will go up. And there's a demand pull element, which is if inventories pile up, that means I don't sell as much as I want, I'm going to decrease my prices. Um, that up. Uh, the interest rate is constant. Debt is just as uh, absorbing any any need. Yeah, and then we assume uh, a fixed share of profits to be distributed. Okay, so it's very simple. And ta-da! This is the demand model. Right, five dimension. So first equation is explaining the wage share. You have again, uh, you have the capacity utilization, U E. You have employment, and then you have inflation. Actually, it should be plus omega 2 times E. There's a typo there. Sorry. I, I hope you all have seen it, yeah? So higher employment, higher capacity utilization implies higher wages. Uh, and then N dot is the inventory, uh, the inventory uh, growth process. And you have here production minus sales. Yeah, <laughs> I shouldn't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> if I injure myself, it's going to be... <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so inventories are basically clearing of the market, right? Whatever is produced and it is not being sold, increase inventories. And then this bit here, it's because we work in ratio. It's actually inventories to capital ratio. And so you have to account for the fact that capital is growing and so on. So this, this bit there is just accounting. Don't, don't, don't look at it. Uh, debt uh, is uh, also... It's written badly, but it's, this is investment minus your uh, return earnings, and then you also have a bit of accounting. This is the capacity utilization decision, which depends on how much you sold minus how much you produced. So it's the adaptive process I was mentioning. And then this is employment. Oh, I forgot. You have learning by doing also. This is the Caldo-Verdun law. And this is here. So employment depends on how much you decide to produce minus the learning by doing. So if you have high employment, then you will have high productivity gains, meaning you have lower employment in the future. Okay? And then these are the price equation. I was mentioning inventory uh, adaptation, 
you have the growth equation, this is the profit rate, which is just basically accounting, this is the demand function, and this is the production function, which depends on how much you expect to, to produce. Right, enough math. What are the results? Because you all want to know, right? Oh, this is a very beautiful model. What is going on? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, this is where the, the economy is always like, ah, it's going up. So we have different steady states. First of all, there are many different possibilities, right? So in, while in most models, usually in macro, you have one possible steady state, and, the, and uh, the economy is always converging to that, so you can push it away, but then it's going to converge slowly. In our case, we simply don't know. There's five different steady states, which all represent different uh, possibilities. And all of these five steady states can be stable, meaning that depending on the parameter value and where you start, you might converge to either of these steady states, which is important. That's something economists have difficulties to deal with, right? How can we have different possibilities, different outcomes? No, I, I, there's one path. It's just the optimum. In this case, you have different equilibriums. And we have find very nice names. So the first one we, uh, and so most of them we can show mathematically, the others we need to do a numerical analysis. Um, so the first one is the empire of the entrepreneurs. What happens is you observe that the wage share is collapsing, going to zero, debt is going to zero, and so entrepreneurs are ruling. There's product, product, positive production only for investment because there's no consumption. Um, but these guys are basically taking all the profits. Of course, these are very uh, like thought experiment. Yeah, I'm not saying we're going to go in there, but but this is giving you an idea. The second uh, steady state we can we can see is that there's a collusion between entrepreneurs and bankers to reduce the wage share to zero and have all the profits for themselves. So wage share equal to zero, but you have positive debt and positive production always for investment. There's a there's a weird bankers rule which leads to economic collapse where wage share is equal to zero, production is equal to zero in, and debt is infinity. That's a very nice one. You want to go there. Uh, <laughs> the last one is a collusion between entrepreneurs and workers where there's no debt but there's positive wage and positive production. And the finally is the holy grail where everyone is happy, there's a bit of debt, there's a bit of production and there's a bit of wage share. Okay. All right, so again, this is very simple. Why am I showing this? It's because you, oh, plenty of time. Why am I showing this? It's because I want to highlight that there are, these three class are all fighting for their own income, right? The entrepreneurs want to increase the profit, but they want to have net profit. They don't care, they don't want to pay interest. They want to have all their profits for themselves. The workers want to have all the income for themselves. They want to have the highest wage share as possible. And the debt and the bankers, they want to have higher debt as possible because they want to have higher income on the debt. And these three classes are fighting. And depending on where you are, you might end up in a situation when one is ruling or the others. And there's only one very specific case where you actually have the three in a situation happy. I know it's unlikely to happen. <laughs> You're right? What is interesting, uh, uh, an interesting preliminary result, is that when you are in the collaborative capitalism, the holy grail, um, what you can show is that if you increase the, the bargaining power of workers, that is the impact of the insider and outsider effect, or if you decrease the money illusion, meaning that, that you, that, that you uh, reduce the price impact on, on, on workers, this tends to stabilize the model. So that implies that the overall trend where we've seen actually a decrease in the power of unions, trade unions, and an increase in the power of entrepreneurs and bankers has led to a decrease in wage share. This tends to destabilize the model in our case, which might explain, and this is very, very far-fetched, and so please take it with a, with a grain of salt, might explain why we have uh, increasing instability in the economy right now. It's actually, it might be perceived as a weakness of workers in the labor market due to the emergence of the dotnet economy and the automa automation and so on and so forth. Now, this is preliminary, we haven't gone further, but, but it fits within, within the model. And uh, yeah, this is something that Stan has done, so I'm, I'm showing it. 
um, well, Stan has, has participated doing. Um, so, so this is just to show you um, th this kind of, uh, remember the, the, the Goodwin uh, cycles when, when it was cycling around the steady state? This is a case where you start here and then you slowly converge towards the steady state, which is here. Sorry? Yeah, this is, this is nice. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and this is how it looks like in, 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 uh, in, in levels, right? So you see that all the, the, the five different dimensions converge towards the, the steady state. And then there's a case where the economy collapses, uh, where you have here uh, no inventories, no debt. This is the zero debt uh, positive production. It doesn't matter. Okay. I have 10 minutes left, roughly. What can we say up to now? So I believe, we believe, uh, that there are, that we need to understand social tensions and we need to understand class struggle. And you need to have this embedded in your macro model. If you don't, believe, if you don't get that, you, you might miss these tensions, these imbalances that are important to understand the boom and bust dynamics we have in our economy. To do so, we extend the framework of Goodwin and goodwin keen to include uh, demand-driven imbalances. We have interesting results. This emergence of the three-class struggle between workers, bankers, and entrepreneurs. And it makes sense, if you think about it, to, 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 to perceive the importance, the increase in the importance of financialization, right? This tends to increase the part of bankers. That implies the two other classes will have to react. Um, there are different steady states, blah, blah, blah. This, again, remember that the model here is descriptive. I'm not saying the economy should be like that. It's just that it, this might happen. Um, and this highlights the fundamental uncertainty, fragility of our economies without a transition and without climate change. Because here, there's only the transitions between the three existing classes. I haven't talked about uh, the transition. I haven't talked about climate change, which is the next step we want to do, but I haven't done yet. So, so this is just a teaser. However, it begs the question, in this context of fragility and tensions, which is embedded within the capitalistic system, how do we make sure that we have a transition? And that's the last part of my, of my talk. So um, I work at, at AFD, which is the development bank slash development agency uh, in France. And one of what my goal, my work is to work on a protocol gem, which is working on thinking about the transition and the macroeconomic impact of the transition, both uh, adaptation processes and attenuation processes. And so the fundamental vision which is driving our, our efforts is first climate change requires an immediate response. And uh, hopefully what I did in the first part of the presentation has convinced you of that. Second is that the low carbon transition implies de facto a socioeconomic structuration, which is Peretz and, and all the uh, neo Schumpeterians. However, there's one thing which is different from the other cases. First, profit is not the one driving the motive, right? Remember that the idea of the transition is we want to avoid future damage, which is not current profits. Second, we have to go very fast, and speed is essential. And the faster you go, the more likely you will have financial tension and social tensions. And third, it's uncertainty. We don't know yet how the world will look like. Okay? Because of all these, finance, climate, economy interactions are important. So you want to have at least these three components in your models. Um, and finally, because of, again, all of these three points, the public sector has a fundamental role to play. We see that the transition cannot happen on its own. I mean, it's 72 was the first time we talked about climate change at the UN level, all right? So it's not going to happen because of the market. Public sector has to play a role in steering and shaping the transition, in coordination of the with the private sector, of course. That's the, the vision. So now, further, how do we make sure that we accept the transition? How do you construct that transition uh, pathway? The second point I was trying to make is that labor market and employment fluctuation will embody the complexity of the tensions emerging from the transition and climate change. And there's many examples here where you have these, these tensions and, and, and fluctuations, which is very likely to increase or intensify fragility, both in among workers, but among non-workers as well. So we need to have some sort of a policy which absorbs this fragility. We need to have uh, progressive policies that are able to counter the negative impact of the transition. And you need to have policies that foster environmental protection. 
That is, you have to make sure that you have complete sustainability. Okay? Sustainability in the environmental field, in the financial and economic field, and in social fronts. And you have to have the three, because if you miss one of the three, of course the transition will not take place. If you don't account for social tensions, you end up with what's happening right now. If you don't account for environmental uh, protection, then you end up in, in the 8.5 degree, uh, the SCP 8.5. If you don't account for economic and financial stability, you end up with boom and bust dynamics. So on top of these three class struggle, you also have these three sustainability struggle between, between them. And they, not, they might not be all aligned, so you might have tensions emerging between these three components of the complete sustainability process. So how do we build this consensus then? Given the, the, the class tensions, given the, the, the different uh, the dynamics of, of sustainability, how do we build consensus? And here, this is where I'm going a bit astray from the literature, and this is more my thoughts. And, and I'm, I'm hoping we can have a fruitful debate about that, because this is really something I'm, 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 I don't have an answer yet. Um, so what we see is that there are numerous interesting initiatives from indi individuals. So you have zero waste, you have minimalism, you have off-grid, and so on and so forth. There's plenty of cases where you've heard about someone living in a yurt somewhere in the south of France. Yeah. Uh, then you have local transitions. Uh, for example, the transition town processes, the consumption and productive cooperatives, but as many of, the, of others, or regional or sectoral, right? So you have the Territoire Zero Chômage in France, you have the Productive Safety Net Program in, in Ethiopia, um, and as many others, okay? Um, they, all are less, they all are more or less related to the commons. The idea that you have this, this concept of the commons, which implies defining a community, defining governance modes and social contracts. So all of these are related to this. But what is a macro narrative? How do we deal with public goods such as health, transportation, social protections? Usually when, when you talk about these individual or local transitions, they don't really account for these macro dynamics. How do you build trust in the context of fundamental uncertainty? And this is where I don't have an answer. <laughs> these are my thoughts. So I think that in order to do this, to respond to the both the macro, the macro uh, uh, mi missing link and in order to deal with the, the trust building, you need to first accept that the, the, the transition is a complex and holistic dynamics, which implies that we are all legitimate to participate in this. We all have a vision and we all be impacted, so we all should be part of the, the, the process. Um, and, sorry, it doesn't matter if we don't know where we're going, because transitions, by definition, are path-dependent and polycentric. And by polycentric, I mean that there is no one center. Every, s every single uh, reality at the local, the regional, or the, the national level have different centers. Okay? So it's the very nature of the complexity. Uh, so because the transition is path-dependent and polycentric, it will emerge as we move on. So we need to start moving. And then we'll see how the transition emerges. And finally, the, the transition is transformative. So it has to be social or it won't exist. You need social cohesion and social protection, fairness as key drivers to explain the transition emerging. Right, now we have time to talk after the break. Thank you. Okay, so thank you again, Antoine, for your very interesting presentation. Um, now, Kezia, Sophie, and I are going to make a few comments on what you did uh, in order to start a discussion. Uh, I will probably be very quick on the, my two first slides because you said a lot about it. It was basically to highlight the fact that it's important to have heterodox economists being involved in the debate about climate change because mainstream are doing a very bad job. As, as said by Antoine, they assume that there is only one good equilibrium in their model and that no matter what <coughs> happens, we will eventually reach the steady state position, uh, which lead to, and this is because of the very stupid hypothesis on the model, basically rational agent with perfect foresight. And this is to reduce the issue of climate change to a trade-off between should we consume more today and accept to have less wealth in the future due to the damages of caused by climate? Or should we restrain our consumption today in order to um, invest in the green economy to have more wealth in the future by mitigating climate change? 
And in opposition, Antoine's model has multiple equilibriums, and in particular has many bad equilibria that allows to represent in the equation in the proper in the equation of the model all the bad scenarios that could occur due to climate change. So the question that is asked by using this kind of model is no longer a very simple trade-off. Uh, it becomes it's the, what you do is that you fully acknowledge that there are um, that climate change could have catastrophic consequences of the economy. Uh, that could potentially lead even to a collapse of our society, and that we have to do everything that is possible to make the model to make the economy stable, to avoid to end up in this situation, which is, in my opinion, a much more interesting and more realistic uh, question to ask about climate change. Uh, so no. I made a few graphs uh, in addition to those presented by Antoine. <laughs> um, so basically, this represents the domain of stability of the equilibrium uh, in, those in looking at three variables, which are the wage share, the employment rate, and the debt to capital ratio. Uh, so all the red points are the points where if the economy is at this position, then every everything is okay. Uh, and if you are outside of this area, you will have a, one of the potential, one of the other bad scenarios that will occur. Um, so the, what you do with the model is that you draw this kind of figure, and then you look at the influence of different parameters on the size of this domain of stability. And, in, and also, you can interpret some relatively intu intuitive mechanics that are typically here. You see that when the debt ratio increases, the domain of stability shrinks which represents the destabilizing effect of debt on the economy. Uh, and you have the same thing for the wage share. The higher the wage share, the more stable the model is. Um, however, something that annoys me a bit are this set of this are this po the points here uh, that looks a bit weird and uh, that I don't really like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and actually, I took some of those points and looked at what is the trajectory when you start from one of those positions that leads you to the equilibrium position. And you see that you have basically non-economically meaningful uh, trajectories with like negative inventories, the weight share that is like much higher than one, um, this, uh, the employment rate which is also higher than one, and utilization again is higher than one, whereas all those variables should be between zero and one. So the trajectory that leads to stability in this case does not really make sense. Um, so my question would be, what, what would you do for this? Uh, my intuition being that maybe the model is still a bit too linear and that adding some non-linearities that would presenting <laughs> preventing this to occur could be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Also, if I uh, forget a bit climate for, for a while, um, I have to be very quick, I think. Uh, I think the more you, you f when in your presentation you focus on the interest of the model for climate change and also on how you kind of solve the, the issues of the standard goodwin kin model. But I think it would also have the potential for bringing more coherence and uniformity in heterodox economic modeling. Basically, if you look at the literature, there are two big families of models, which are those rely relying on the goodwin kin framework that Ant Antoine presented, and those who are more post keynesian typically uh, Kaleki or Keldor mo model. Um, and those two models are very different in a uh, Kalekian framework uh, where profit share and wage share are ex exogenous and output is demand determined and it's the inverse in the Goodwin model. And it's sometimes complicated when you look at the literature because you have papers that can look at the same kind of problem on the same sub type of subject but are using very different models and then it's difficult to compare the paper and the, the work done by different authors. And your model has the properties of both type of, uh, of models. So it could be a way to connect those two branches of literature, which for me will be very interesting. The only issue is that uh, post Keynesian economists will argue that uh, investment has to depend on demand, uh, uh, demand side uh, elements, typically on the utilization rate. Uh, whereas in your model, the investment function still depend on uh, uh, the profit rate. Um, and utilization. Uh, and utilization. In your model? In your I think there is utilization. Utilization and profit rate. Yeah. Yeah, but then there is a criticism of the double account. Badgery Marglin about the fact that we should not do that. <laughs> 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 yeah.
Yeah, I, I wanted to know if you try to rewrite the model with a, a pure like Pascalekian investment function, and if or if not, if there is any reason not to do that. Of course, I, I don't have anything against the investment function you have. It's simply my objective would be to make a model that makes everyone happy. Okay. So now it's my part. Uh, we saw with the presentation that we have to face many challenges to the transition. Uh, but I'm discussing here some part of the challenges uh, from the social point of view and the role of different actors in the change, in the transition. Uh, first, as the professor said, uh, there are many actors uh, involved in the transition and we need a broad social consensus. <coughs> Otherwise, we cannot achieve the outcomes that we want. Um, these different actors are like government and experts and entrepreneurs and everyone involved in the economy. We are all responsible, as the professor said, uh, for the implementation of the, the low carbon economy that we need. Um, the shift to an environmentally sustainable is necessary ur and urgent. Every time we discuss the climate change, we are always um, pointing that <coughs> this, is, this needs to be fast and far-reaching, uh, and we need to do this now because it becomes to be really bad in the future. Um, another thing is that there is no single answer. We have to discuss and we have to um, take into account many different positions uh, because it's a complex issue. Um, so the some problems in the urge of transforming an entire economy in a relatively short period. I'm saying that a relatively short period because uh, we need to do this fast. So uh, first, uh, from the private sector, if the private sector takes the first seat and tries to uh, find a solution and drives the economy towards this transition, uh, maybe the motive to do this can be corrupted or, I don't know, we can follow a profit motive instead of following and trying to uh, find a, a public and a society societal uh, motive for this. Uh, and we know that the profit motive is not the main um, driver of this transition, different from dif the f different from the transitions that we had before. Um, from the side of individual agents like us, uh, we I'm not saying that we are ignorant, but we don't have the idea of the full range of problems. Uh, the policy makers and the decision makers are more aware of the problems and the outcomes of the transition. Uh, for individual agents, it's really difficult to, because there is a lack of information between the uh, scientists, uh, the information coming from science for, uh, for us and for normal people. So it's really difficult to, uh, to prospect this. Uh, and this can invite them to resist the change or actively or passively, or to take this and um, um, delay it. Um, uh, from the side of the countries, uh, there is a problematic issue, that is the getting all the countries together uh, to agree to a global govern governance. Uh, it's a huge diplomatic achievement. It's really difficult to put everyone together uh, following the same uh, objective. So, uh, so how to move from a non-cooperative to a cooperative situation? How to move from uh, a situation that we are not taking action to the transition to try to do something uh, from the side of different actors? Uh, from the side of individual agents, uh, the professor also said uh, we can do some, we can have some part like changing consum consumption and behavioral patterns, uh, enter collaborative projects, uh, try to go beyond the individual logic and participating uh, in sharing and adop adopting sustainability issues, uh, values. Uh, for the private sector, private sector has a, a bigger role uh, in 
to overcome the profit, profit motive. Uh, it's going to be really difficult. We have many structural changes that m might going to lead to, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, negative um, results for the private sector. So, and the public sector has the crucial role in redirecting resources, helping to launch new technologies, defining targets, uh, informing and uh, spreading knowledge. Uh, besides that, uh, the private sec the public sector has the the role in coordinating the the public uh, the public and the private sector and the individual act actors to uh, understand the the objectives and make some policy and making something to move uh, the economy and the social uh, policy towards the transition. Mm. And uh, there is this uh, theory that is not about the transition and the climate change, uh, but uh, there are this Sweden um, so, uh, political scientists uh, talking about social traps and the problem of trust. That is something that Professor also pointed. Um, a social trap is a situation where individuals, groups, or organizations are not willing to cooperate because they think that others will not co cooperate, uh, and they will all they will cooperate only if they can trust that others will cooperate. So, it's a situation that uh, we can relate with the climate problem because we need to see that all the the, the actors are going together, not only countries and um, there are all different sides that to go further, go towards this objective. So if just the individuals <coughs> take this action, maybe it's not um, uh, sufficient. Um, and and uh, solution come from above. Uh, the existence of public and political institutions together with public policies will be the key issue in the case of the climate change. Um, so as I said, like trust can can be established from above. Um, yeah, that's it, Sophie. Yes. Um, so Kezia has highlighted right now how difficult it is to actually mitigate a social transition and it's also something Antoine has said in his presentation that he's not too sure how to translate this in policies. So what I will do right now on my part is to focus on what are the policy implications of a social transition, so what is out there in terms of policy proposals. And before we start, um, it's ob obviously important to look at what kind of stakeholders do we have, so do, who do we have to address. So, as already said, we have people that are currently benefiting from the system. I think everybody has a couple in mind. And then we have the group of people that are fearing um, damage to their livelihoods from, this, from the transition, if not social, due to the uncertainty connected to it and the inequality or rising inequality that they associate with it. And finally, we have a group of people that is inherently connected to the second group that are stakeholders that are more <coughs> focusing on near-term problems than on long-term problems because it's just so much more imminent to them right now. So the question is, what are concepts that actually ensure that we overcome the different interests of these people so that we enable a social transition? And policymakers have come up with um, the concept of a just transition, which is something that's enshrined in the Paris Agreement, but actually goes back to the 1970s of, uh, trade unions in the US. And it's the idea that we are not um, disproportionately um, putting the cost of a social, of a green transition on low income groups or on the poor, so that we have an equal cost sharing in the society. So what we have obviously connected to this is this notion of fairness that Antoine has talked about, of perceived fairness, and using fairness as an instrument to overcome the issues between the two groups or the diff diverging interests and their fears. And it connects also to what Kezia has just said. We have the issue of trust, of lacking trust. And if, we have, if people perceive something as fair, it is likely for them to gain trust into something. So it's really a key element if we want to enable a social transition. So what is actually, what are the goals of a social transition? Obviously we want a social, uh, if just transition to be fair, just and inclusive. And this links with the inclusive growth agenda of most 
uh, governments, international bodies, which is the idea that growth encompasses every individual. Um, <coughs> second, so it has the idea of social justice with connected to it. Then we want to protect the livelihoods, um, health, safety, and the environment, <coughs> obviously. So it's the idea to produce <coughs> decent work for everyone, to advance job creation, and to ensure employment for individuals over the time. Again, here the link with already existing concept, which is the decent work agenda by the ILO. And finally, we want to build a strong consensus and trust, which I already said above, um, which I'll go <coughs> in a bit deeper later on. So what we see is that this concept of a just transition encompasses a social, economic, and environmental dimension and hopes to bring positive outcomes for social, economic, and environmental actors. We have then three pillars on which this concept builds on, which is first, a social dialogue and coherence among policy and stakeholders. Second is social protection and workers' rights, which Antoine has touched upon a bit. So it's the idea to build resilience, to safeguard workers' um, rights and their living standards, and to shelter them from negative impacts of climate change, economic restructuring, and resource constraints. So, for example, the workers that are all affected, um, that are all working in jobs that are connected to, um, uh, how was it? Um, uh, climate-based uh, works, basically, like this over a billion easy. workers. Yeah, exactly. So how can we shelter these people? And then finally, we have the third pillar, which is the idea to create productive employment and decent work for everyone. So to complement the social protection and the workers' right dimension, as it's key to maintain the livelihood of individuals and make them supported and to have a well-managed transition. And we want to build, or the idea is to build these three different pillars with the help of nine different policy fields. I will not read them out here. Um, macroeconomic and growth policy, obviously, all uh, employment targeted, and all of them have the idea of bringing labor in the focus and incorporating labor issues in transition policies. And what I will focus on right now is the last point, so the social dialogue, because <coughs> it's actually the corner, or the, the keystone, for all the other policies. If we don't have a social dialogue which gives fairness to the policy ideas and which gives trust of the individuals in a transition, we'll not be able to, to implement any of the other policy dimensions. Oops, that doesn't work. So, yeah, so as I said, social dialogue is the idea that it's essential to a strong consensus and essential to build a pathway that we can go on and to have trust in the transition, so that transition will bring about something positive and not only negative effects. So it's key to integrate particularly the group of people that are fearing to, have even great, to experience even greater inequality. And therefore, it's essential to the other policies. Furthermore, social dialogues so bringing together different stakeholders on the table is important to achieve coherence between different policies and a framework that works for all stakeholders. So it's really the idea to have governments in there, to have uh, the business sector in there, to have workers in there because this is often the group that is the most negatively affected or that is in the limelight for the negative effects and also social society actors, so institutions, um, public initiatives. And it's the idea to create a dialogue that is on an eye to eye basis. So you don't have any difference, like for example, workers are not less work than entrepreneurs. So it's really supposed to be a talk on an eye to eye basis which is respectful and which is supposed to um, assess and to weigh different concerns and bring them together and to bring them to make people say them so that they can be addressed. So it's important to create, this is the only way we can create stable policies and actually mainstream tra green transition and green and social transition policies because if we don't have coherence, we cannot make them broadly applicable. Furthermore, this obviously allows us to customize policies because if we don't know what individuals need, we cannot customize policies and we have a one-fits-all approach, which will definitely not bring us anywhere. And finally, it's the idea that the social dialogue is an ongoing process. So it's not only something that happens once in time, but it's something that is basically ongoing, that all the stakeholders are included in every process. So it's in the policy drafting, in the implementation part, and in the assessment part, which then enables to adapt the policies and to make them a bit more fitting if we see that there's still edges, for example. 
And on the other hand, the social dialogues enables the labor dimension, the strong labor dimension of the just transition. So it enables to transmit and strengthen labor concerns among the, uh, through the other policy fields. Because if we don't have that, if we don't include workers in the, di in the dialogue um, about other policy fields, we'll have experts on the sector bringing about the concerns of the sector, but we'll not have anything inclusive. So what does that actually mean in terms of trade policies? Which that means we need to create institutional bodies and a process for these dialogues, which will be a massive thing. There are already existing some initiatives, for example, to include um, indigenous people um, in policy making. However, I had the impression while I was researching it that most policies or most reg frameworks on that date back to the 90s, early 2000s, and there has nothing been recently introduced on it and also nothing to really include a broader group of people, particularly workers. We need to adapt national plans and policies to a just transition and make a just transition to put it on the agenda of all ministries so don't we, that we don't only have one government body that works towards it, but it needs to be a common goal of everyone. So again, coherence and working towards a common goal. And finally, we need to translate the solution of the social dialogue in the different policy fields so that we then spread these concerns and, and the, the, the regard of labor in it. And what this means is nicely illustrated here by um, a figure of the ILO. So for example, here, if you want to create more jobs, so you have policy development, and all of this is supposed to, like all the stakeholders are supposed to be included in it. And this is the idea of the ongoing process that's basically a never ending process if you want to. And um, here you see the idea that we want to spread the labor standards via the social dialogue across different um, dimensions. Um, yeah, and I have a couple of questions on that, <laughs> obviously, too. <laughs> so the two first questions are the ones um, Stan already raised. And um, I find the idea of fairness obviously very good. However, I find it very, very difficult to use a value as an instrument. Because from my point of view, you cannot break that link between fairness and it being a value, therefore being subject to bias, individual bias, and also subject to change. So how do you want to assure that we have, that we first of all find one definition of fairness that works for all stakeholders of the society, and then that this is a stable value or it's a stable benchmark that we can use to guide the process so it doesn't change, I'd say, like every three months or so, but that it's something that is reliable, a reliable cornerstone to make judgments. And um, then I want to, would like to know trust building for sure, but we already have such an eroded trust in our institutions, and you pointed that out in your paper. How do you want to re-establish and strengthen trust if you, we are already facing, if we face even greater challenges than we have expected and uh, than we have experienced in the last years? So I feel that it's, it's, very, it's a very narrow path. And then finally, which ties to both of them, what is the feasibility and the chances of success? Because it's a really great concept, but I feel as everything bases on this idea of social dialogue, it's going to rest a really, like it's going to stay a really well intended policy agenda, but nothing implementable. <coughs> yes. And Kizia has another question. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one question. It's related to this, uh, the square that you showed for us. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, like, I'm convinced that coordination is a, a, a big issue and we need this. Uh, but if we have uh, the same objective, but there are many, uh, what we need are different ways to get it, how to coordinate and to have a global governance. So that's my question. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Right. Um, thank you, guys. Yes. Should How does it work? Does, do I collect more questions, or should I just? Sure. And then we collect three, and then you. All right. Um, okay. So is the model still too linear? Um, so, uh, right, so I mean, it, it, 
I don't think it's too linear, but the question is how do you deal with the fact that um, you might end up in economically non-meaningful situations, right? So you were showing you can have cases where employment goes above 100% or whatever, negative debts or whatnot. Um, and, and so um, two answers to that. One which is, which is not a non-answer, which is, well, first of all, it's a model. And so you shouldn't trust it. And, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and so um, if it has negative or weird stuff, I wouldn't take it as, as it is, but I wouldn't take it as a highlight of tensions emerging from these dynamics, right? So if you have more than full employment, the system will not allow it. So, so, so you need to either, what you can do is corner the system and just say, well, you reach full employment, then you push it back and you say, well, there's a feedback and prices, inflation, whatever. Uh, but, but then that complicates the model much. Uh, so it depends on what you want to do with the model. If the model is there to highlight some, some, some interesting dynamics, then I would leave it as it is. If, if the model is there to, to do forecasting or scenario building and so on, then you would need, need to, to corner the model. I, d I didn't really answer your question, uh, but I know it. Um, uh, the investment function. All right, so we did think about a lot about it. Um, so um, we did consider in uh, the profit uh, share. We didn't really consider. Um, uh, we have utilization and profit rate. Uh, we did uh, think about what Baduri Marling say about uh, you can't do the two. Um, the trick is that because we have inventories, it changes a bit the dynamics. So the profit, you don't have the exact equality that, that uh, Badu and Wang were, were showing. In, in, uh, in our case, the profit rate changes slightly because of the demand-driven stuff. So, so we have to think a bit more carefully about this. Uh, Devrim is really aware of this. Um, but I agree that it would be nice to... to, to and, and, and so far, when we present to among Poskangians, I'm sorry, this is really a church battle. But um, when we presented among, among post Keynesians, they were saying, "Ah, oh, this is interesting," uh, because they couldn't f they couldn't really find they couldn't attack as easily as the, the Goodwin model, uh, as they did with the Goodwin model. Right? Um, nice graphs, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So I had questions and remarks. So I'll, I'll just do the two. Um, so first of all, I, I, I'm not really convinced that the profit is always misaligned with uh, the transition. And it m you might have actually a profit motive that drives the transition as well. It depends on what is the, the time horizon you're looking at. Is it immediate profit or long-term profits? And, and so um, I, I, I just try to moderate a bit what you were saying. And you're saying, well, the profit is always, I, I think... Yeah, the short run profit might, but it's still, I mean, you'd, anyway, I, I'm, what I'm saying is, is it, I'm trying to just choose, yeah. Um, the second question, and I think it's related to, to your question, which is, okay, how do you build this, coordinate this global agenda? And, and which was also the fact that, can we have a same objective for government? The idea of the Paris Agreement was actually, actually trying to tackle that, right? So we have a common goal, which actually can evolve, which is let's go below two degrees, and 1.5 is possible, but the, the way in which you uh, address these is by using these NDC, nationally determined contributions, which is basically each country saying, oh, I'm going to reduce by blah. And then you take stock and you say, eh, you know what guys, whatever you said you would be doing leads us to four degrees. So this is not enough, but you guys have to decide. And I think it's interesting, this, 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 this argument whereby you don't have a coercive approach where you say this is the path, the path is decided by you guys, but then at some point you take stock and you decide. The problem is that when you don't reach the objective, what do you do? Um, and so that's the drawback. At least the Paris Agreement I, I had everyone on the table, and you didn't end up in a situation where there was nothing. But on the other hand, uh, the drawback is, is um, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I'm only a macroeconomist, so I assume stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it is, it, so it is really an issue of, of uh, global governance. Um, and what is interesting is that usually, I mean, you have had countries which had a very strong stake. And so you had like small islands, uh, for example, being extremely, uh, I, I, I think it's, I can't remember which, country, which, which small island just uh, went uh, uh, carbon free, uh, like in, in five years from now. 
Um, so they, of course, they have a high stake, even though they emit nothing, they have a high stake, so they were very proactive in the, in the process. But for example, Colombia is interesting in this case, not anymore, but it used to be the case, where they were extremely active, even though they weren't so much impacted, they are, they have a Niño La Niña, but they weren't so much impacted, um, they weren't a big emitter, but, but so you do have, I mean, you have like these uh, white knights that can help you in, in building consensus. White Knights, I think it's a French translation. Anyway. Um, Sophie. Um, uh, rup, 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 uh, questions. Uh, right, so, so is fairness the answer? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I, I think it's... Um, I think the... the concept has to be discretionary because every situation is going to be different and so you can't enact if it's only economic uh, indicators you won't get the transition if it's an overarching so so it's because fairness is relative that it actually is an interesting concept in the case of the transition because every single initiative will be dependent on the context but you, what you are right, and I think what is missing in the, in the paper I sent you, is this idea of the social dialogue to determine what is fairness. Because then, I mean, this is, this is the, the key point, and I think that's what I try to, to assess, is you need to have everyone in the table, because everyone is legitimate, because everyone will be impacted. And by the way, there's one thing missing in your assessment of the, it's the future generations. In the stakeholders, <laughs> sorry, but 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 so so I think this is this is the key, right? So so fairness be, being uh, being this relative process forces you to put to have social dialogue, and and this is the beginning of the, the acceptance. But on the other hand, it's vague. So when you say, "Oh, I'm going to use fairness as the way to assess my policy," then everyone is like, "Ha ha, you you are wanker, just jog on, kid." So this is the trick. Uh, how do you deal with 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 this? And I, I agree. Uh, I mean, yeah, and I don't, I don't imply fairness as cost sharing. It's fairness as perceived fairness, mm -hmm. which implies that you, you might not have costs in, in impacted, but you want to be heard. Um, I think the problem of trust is partially related to the climate change, right? So there's, uh, my understanding of the, the erosion of trust is first not understanding that the, the. Uh, IT revolution changed the way in which we, the labor market works. And that's, that's a big miss. And since then, and you can see, I mean, Carola Pellet says that, right? So 2000, you have the dot in the crisis, 2007, the subprime crisis, 2010, the, the, the debt crisis, uh, and whatnot. I mean, you're gonna have some of them. And as long as you don't understand that this is because the power structure has changed, you'll keep on having this. And, and, and the gilet jaune is also a problem of, of labor market. Not only, but also. So, so, this is part of the transition, to any transition, and the problem is that climate change exacerbates this, right? So the, the spring, uh, the Arab Spring revolutions is, is triggered also by climate change. Chad, Lake Chad, uh, Lake Chad revolutions, Syria. So these exas climate change exacerbates the tensions which are inherent to the, to, to climate, uh, to capitalistic societies. So trust, I mean, you, d there's no need, I mean, there's no other choice. You have to have trust because, the, as I said, uh, and, and we were saying, tr it's transformative, so you have to have trust. So you're right, it's, it's, I think it's, the challenges are greater because of the lack of trust. So it is the, the first point. Um, and the chance of success? Uh, yeah. Um, so we, we already have a couple of questions collected. Um, I'll add Mohib. And the first round is Arno, Philip, and Neil. So we collect three questions and then. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, I'm Arno from Track B, which is a finance and uh, macro, I think. <laughs> and uh, I'm from Quebec. <laughs> and so I have one qu comment and one question. My comment is that uh, you were talking about cost and benefits in making decisions. And it seems like this way of making decisions does not lead to the, the change we want to see. So it sort of points to the fact that our economic system is not in tune with the needs of society. So we might want to think about that. This is my comment. Uh, but my question is uh, trying to make the link. You said that there was no link yet between the model and the transition. 
And this is basically my question. What link can we see? I, you said that there was uh, five steady states, one that was the uh, holy grail, the most, uh, the, the ideal. So is there, for, for the successful transition, is there a steady state that we're aiming for that is meant to be successful? So uh, yeah, that's my question. Like, yeah. I think it's clear. Thank you, Mr. Goodin, for that great presentation. Uh, I'm Philip. Uh, I'm from Option C, from Germany. Um, and yeah, you um, you said you want to adopt a complete vision of sustainability, right? Um, uh, um, I wonder if it then suffices to uh, like if we talk about economy environment interactions, if it if it suffices to talk about only climate change, because if we if we um, uh, actually appreciate what the natural scientists tell us, especially if, or for example, um, Rockström and L, um, that defined this, the, the the concept of planetary boundaries, they clearly show that climate change or the climate is just one of nine planetary boundaries, and there are um, Earth system processes um, that. There are nine Earth system processes that we need to consider to keep both human and human non-human life on Earth, um, uh, yeah, sustainable basically. So, what about acidification of oceans and so on? Can we include that in, in the model? That's that's um, one question. And the second question um, relates to making the model more complicated. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm not an, F an SFC modeler, but um, uh, when I read um, uh, Georgescu Rajan and the economic process, he, uh, yeah, he basically says that um, with, well, the economic process, what it's actually about is material energy flows. And um, if we then th um, think about, it, then he related to thermodynamics and, um, and says, well, in a closed system, um, uh, the energy is always constant. And, um, and basically, well, burning fossil fuels is basically about just transforming energy. Um, uh, so could we could we uh, like somehow build a model that takes into account the stocks and flows of um, of uh, yeah um, uh, um, uh, what he calls low entropy energy levels in a, um, and combine it with with uh, the Godwin model? That's <laughs> my question. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Nils from Option C two. So it's macroeconomics and development and. Like I'm not a modeler, so maybe my question doesn't make sense, and it's not going to be very clear. I'm so, I'm sorry uh, in front of that. Uh, so my, I kind of have a big problem with that model. Is like um, I I don't see at all any um, theoretical insights from uh, development literature, in the sense of uh, what uh, how do we consider in that model the countries that actually still need to develop and the fact that. The, the most um, sensitive path to development that we have is intense capital accumulation with uh, high profit rates in the short term, first in like a closed market and then the, in the open economy. And the problem is like we're, we're talking about a model that works with already developed countries where we can actually have a reallocation of consumption or talking about social dialogue and like everything that you put in that model. But uh, how can we do that, for instance, with countries that are already semi-industrialized, like I'm thinking for instance about South Africa, where like the idea of uh, rethinking social conflict is just completely out of the box. First, there's something else to be done. Or some other countries that are clearly not industrialized. Like uh, if, we, if we take a lot of countries that might be, I don't know, like Mozambique or Namibia or everything. Anyways. Right. Um, yeah, I think the cost benefit analysis of economics is completely outdated. Um, it is clear um, there are numerous cases, and, and climate change is one of the best examples of that, right? So there's, there's the cost-benefit analysis works well when you are in an I idealized world, but in the case of climate change, you have many different frictions according to the, the mainstream literature, which is uh, insider-outsider, you have free rider, you have... So there's plenty of examples where, the ex in this specific case, but in general, the cost-benefit analysis doesn't work. And that's the problem with, with what was, as Stan was saying, it's the main problem with all these, these yams, which in general are just saying, it's, it's refinement around this idea. Uh, you're avoiding future damages by uh, increasing costs today. And, it's, and it boils down to that. And in the end, at the end, the debate is always, okay, what is the 
this counting factor, and what is it the technological change you assume? And I, I, I think it's completely useless. So you're right. I, 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 I do think that, and that's that's it's probably one of the problem of macro, and that's why there's so much discussion about the state of macro. It's because you perceive somehow that in the end, it doesn't. It works well in a situation where there's no social tensions, but as soon as you, it doesn't work. Um, Right, the link between the model and transition. Um, so there's two cases. The, the one I was mentioning to, to uh, David at the pose, which was basically if you add climate, a climate module in this, you might see a change in the stability or the what, what uh, Stan was showing, the basin of attraction, which, is, which says when you start somewhere, where do you go? Do you go towards the holy grail or do you go towards one of the bad equilibrium? And currently, he showed one basin of attraction, but there's, m there's, actually, there's actually many of them. Because th so this is showing just going towards the good equilibrium, but if you start there, you might go to a different equilibrium. So they're all intricate. And if you add a climate change on top of this, the shape of this will change. And in the, in the supply-driven Godin model, the size of the sh basin of attraction for the good equilibrium shrunk. So what happens is that climate change basically says it's more complicated to get towards the good equilibrium. Uh, you said there was five outcomes? Yeah. Can you talk about one good? Yeah. All the others are... you don't want to go there. because okay, the, the one you call the holy grail. Yeah. Is this this one? That's the size of... yeah, that's the one. Oh, that's... okay, that's the, the one out of five we... Yes. That is the best for ecological... That's... that's... no, that's the best for social tensions. Now, the thing is that currently there's, there's no ecological stuff in there. Ah, okay. Right? Yeah. But if you add... Yes then this is going to change, and it's likely to be smaller. Okay, but uh, regardless of whether we include the ecological transition, we're aiming for the same one state. Technically, yes, unless you want to have bankers ruling the world. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sure, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll respond to, d because the two are somewhat related. Um, so, uh, yes, you're right. Uh, we only talk about one aspect of the sustainability, and, and there's eight others which are completely missing. Um, and this is one example. But, but uh, th so, yes, you're definitely right. Uh, the only thing is that the modeling exercise to include all of these eight, and when you can add actually more, requires it's a very different exercise than the one we have here. This is the Meadows report. And, and the Meadows report is interesting because of the multidisciplinarity aspects, right? So, so uh, have you heard about Meadows, the limit to growth uh, uh, report written in the 70s uh, by Meadows at the MIT? And, and basically what he shows, he's doing something similar to our, but in a much more extended idea, right? So, and there's less economics, there's more natural sciences and so on. And what he says, he shows is that the, the, he, he designs different scenarios and he shows that there are some scenarios which are leading to a collapse of the entire economy or the entire world. And he's got two scenarios which lead to collapse and we are on the path of these two scenarios right now. So 40 years afterwards, we are, ex I mean, he's, 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 it's impressive because he, he ticks most of the boxes, right? I think what is interesting in there, which relates to your idea of thermodynamics, is he was right and he was so good at actually perceiving the dynamics because he was connecting different sciences. Because he wasn't relying as a macroeconomist on, let's assume this, or proxies. And if you were wrong on one dynamics, you have 19 others that help you ground your model into the right dimensions. This is, I mean, honest, I know that Ugo Bardi in, in Torino is, is uh, trying to revamp uh, Meadows. That, to me, is the most exciting uh, stuff that can, can, can be done. Um, and just to, to add thermodynamics, there's plenty of examples. So there's a paper on SFC and uh, George S. Rogan with uh, by Da Fermos, 2017, in Ecological Economics. Uh, it's a SFC, I, can't, I forgot the name, but if you send me an email, I'll forward you the... the but it, it, is, it has been embedded in the, into the software consistent. And then there's plenty of people working on thermodynamics. Steve Keen has a paper, but there's, there's loads, and in Paris as well, there's, there's, so there's loads of stuff. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, the development literature. Um, um, two answers. So you're right in a sense that, that we are in a situation where there's no supply constraints, uh, which then you could go back to the Goodwin models, but 
I'm not quite sure. Um, so this is actually a drawback. Now, part of my job at AFD is doing this kind of uh, toy models. That's a very tiny part. Uh, most of the part I'm doing is actually building empirical models for specific countries, where we go deeper into these questions, which is, OK, we, uh, we, we do look at the different constraints of an economy and try to understand how do we adapt to that context. And you're right, you, can't, you don't talk the same way. I think the transition is also extremely important for them. And there's lots of examples where they show that actually um, uh, more resilient, I mean, there's, there's an there's a alignment between transition and increase equality or increase development, or certain increase of development, right? So, so there are cases where you can achieve the two. You don't have to put them orthogonally, where you say, I'm actually going to do a transition to a low carbon economy, or I'm developing. I think you can align the two. It's not always the case. And you have to f do stuff. The PSNP, for example, is interesting for that in Ethiopia. Uh, but so, so, so uh, you're right. The, the, these theoretical models usually, especially these simple models, usually consider a developed economy. And, and it begs the question of, where, OK, but what do we propose then? And the answer is we work with these countries. Um, I, I do agree with uh, yeah. your, your principle of like it's possible, but the problem is like we're trying to do something that builds up scenarios and the, the research in developing countries when you like at, I'm just talking about my experience in South Africa, but I guess it's reproducible yeah. in different places. Uh, when you talk to uh, development economists there or industrial economists about uh, how do you integrate uh, transition and how do you integrate kind of a green growth in one way or another with one aspect of the sustainability, uh, the answer most of the time is uh, like countries that have developed didn't do that and I don't see why we should do it. So there's clearly like a refusal of that and it's it might be a bit ambitious in a way to think that like these countries, if they can have this path for growth that is sustainable, are going to take it because like they're not for me. Uh, they're really rushing yeah, towards something so else. No, so I mean, just to give you examples, um, you can connect uh, the fisc a green fiscal reform with uh, an increase in formalization. So you have a lot of literature on co-benefits of the the uh, transition, and formalization might be an aspect. Um, you might have uh, employment aspect. I mean, the ILO in its 2018 report is, is trying to do that, right? So it's trying to say, okay, is there ways in which we can combine development and transition? And I do think that, be unfortunately, because most of the climate damages are going to happen in the global south, you can show that increased resilience happens through green growth or this is a very vague concept, but what happens to a transition to a low carbon. The two are connected. And, and so, so trying, and this is where, but it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a narrative to build, and I, I completely agree with you that there's, there's not en enough theoretical work on this. Um, but, uh, but I disagree with the fact that you can't have this, this, this uh, discourse. We have it. Um, not always, it's not always easy. I just, I was in Colombia uh, a month and a half ago, and it was very difficult because the new government is changing everything. And Colombia is not Africa, right? So, so, so we, we are working in Ivory Coast, for example, on, on the GEM project. And so, so it is possible, but it, is, it, it does require to really think carefully about the context. But I think it is possible. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? And I, I agree with you. Uh, yeah. So hello, so my name is Louis, option B2. Yeah, I know you know it, but that's the usual literal. Um, so yeah, I, my question builds a bit on uh, Philip's ones, uh, namely that actually if we take into account material constraints and others, maybe we don't want to have grow, green growth or decoupling, but we want to have at least a steady state economy or if we really want to have something I I think sustainable degrowth or something like this. And in model in modern frameworks such as so Goodwin and your augmented Goodwin uh, framework, you you have growth, you have positive capital accumulation. So at least in in equilibrium, that's roughly growth model. So how would you first how would you make for a steady state uh, economy? in such a framework, and that uh, begs in turn the question of how do you frame class conflicts within uh, a steady state? Stationary state, you mean? Sorry? Stationary state. 
it's, like so, zero uh, uh, yeah, so, sorry, yeah, st a stationary state world. Because basically we are back to Varas, so what's the modes of coordination we would have if it's not cluster, or if we can call it coordination? Thank you. Uh, hello, my, my name is Mateus, I'm from Option B, Macroeconomics. Uh, my question is related to your data about the ecological footprint. Um, is, uh, is, is this data based on the production of each country, the ecological footprint of the production of each country, like traditionally have, has always been and many, many people do it, or is it based, and my way of thinking doesn't uh, incorporate uh, effective demand, or is it based on the consumption and the dem products demanded by each country, like many authors such as Piketty have proposed? Um, hello, my name is Yannick. I'm also from the development uh, track. Um, so I was just wondering, because I really like the uh, space of the uh, uh, HDI and uh, sustainability, and because it, it's like really simply showing the goal and how far we are away from that and takes into account this uh, socioeconomic uh, dimension. So is there a dynamic version of that? Uh, <coughs> and then uh, so that we can could see if the countries are still moving away from that uh, magic box, or how you called it. And also, <coughs> um, if the developing countries are first moving uh, upwards, or maybe make it more directly to this box, or like, yeah. Right. Uh, I'm not going to answer to Louis. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, stationary state. Um, <coughs> Um, first of all, if you have population growth and stationary state, then by definition you end up in a weird situation, especially if you work in per capita terms. So you have to assume a zero growth population. Sure. And in that case, uh, actually it simplifies the model a lot because <laughs> you have no growth. Uh, so you have m budget constraints which are much simpler to, uh, to address. I haven't looked at that. Um, because I always get the criticism, oh, you're doing a stationary state, and economies are supposed to grow. Um, now, the fact that you don't, you could, I'm, I'm just asking a question here, I don't have an answer, but you could theoretically have a growing economy without capital accumulation, as long as whatever is growing is actually capital free. So, a um, service based economy, right? So which I, I everlasting, I don't know, but uh, I mean, the, I don't like too much the green growth concept because I think it's it's misleading and it does lead to the impression that actually you can uh, you can go on forever uh, or you can have a decoupling. In the end, I do think that transition is transformative and requires a change in the, in the way in which we in which we think about the goal of our economies. Is it just growing GDP or not? Um, that being said, I mean, I'm going very away from the model because I'm just speedballing here on, but I think that <coughs> what would be interesting to say, instead of talking about growth, is saying about the composition of GDP and hence the growing or not effect of the GDP, right? So if you do, um, recently a, a great economist by, um, from Italy died, uh, uh, Lunghini. And he had written a, paper, a, a short book saying um, the problem is that the market decides what is worth being produced while, and so you end up in a situation where you have unemployment and needs are still unsatisfied. And so I think this is a very interesting uh, point, right? Right, so, so my point is can you have a change in the, in the structure of GDP and so achieve some sort of a growing environment whereby you can still absorb um, slack. Because the trick is, why do you want to have growth? Is because you want to have lower employment, unemployment, usually, or higher income. But, but that is achievable without growth, because it depends on the, on, on the structure of the production process. I'm not really answering your question, am I? No, uh, it's just that maybe I miss My main concern is how can we be demand-led in a world where we have constraints on the amount of resources we can oh, tap so from? So how do you combine supply constraints and demand-led models? Right. Um, okay. 
I have, I have one model where I try to tackle that in a very weird way, but it's prices. This is the, uh, that's the only way I, I see it. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's a production uh, footprint and I think you're, and I, I believe you're right, it should be a consumption footprint, uh, which would probably make stuff even worse, especially for the North. Uh, well, um, I need to check. And there's a dynamic version. I can't remember where I saw it. Cuba used to be on the on on the border of the Magic Square before it opened. And the question <laughs> is, and the question is, do you want to live in Cuba before it opened? Is this your target? I mean, I'm just I'm just saying. I'm just pointing. But so yeah, I I I did I didn't look so much because I used the I used the HDI just as as a way to relate. This is everyone is concerned. But I, you're right. There's there's more. It's I think it's a, a carbon footprint network or something like that. But there are there are dynamic versions. I've seen dynamic versions of it, and you see the countries move. Um, we have for the next round one more spot free for a question. Anybody? If not, it's Mohib and then Luisa. Oh, yeah, and then Matthias. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Mohib. So, I mean, I'm kind of building on the previous questions. So the first question, oh, the question that I have is, you're saying that it's about structural transformation and structural change, the green economy. The question is, what would a labor coefficient or a production coefficient in that structural transformed economy look like? What is the input composition and what is the output composition? So what is the production technological labor coefficient? And the second question is a very generic question. I think, why do you want to model climate change as a heterodox economist, simply? Why, you know, what is so special about heterodox economics that we want to model climate change? I mean, if going by what Louis is saying, if the problem is about if we are supply constrained and if neoclassical theory is all geared towards allocation of resources, efficient, optimal allocation, why not incorporate some elements? And I mean, if we are using even those, f yeah, I think yeah, that's the question. question. Yeah, sure. Hello, my name is Luisa. Um, before I start my question, I want to encourage my female colleagues to speak up a bit more in the trans seminars and to participate <coughs> a bit more in the discussion because it's always the same people speaking. <coughs> and I would like to hear what, what you say. Um, so straight to my question, uh, it's a, a more technical one, not really, but it concerns the model and the plan you have uh, for like going on with incorporating the, the climate change and the transition. And so the basic model includes inventories and even though I like that idea I wonder if it matters when it comes to to in considering climate change because on the slides you s you showed in the very beginning um, we saw that many jobs um, most affected by climate change are actually in uh, in the area where agriculture matters or they're in the agricultural part and in sector similar to that and there, I wonder if inventories do make sense because if it's if it's food or agricultural products, it doesn't really work. Um, but I understand it's a general model, so yeah, I, I see that. But if it's if it should be applicable also to developing economies, which are often dependent on or strongly dependent on the agricultural sector, then I wonder if that creates a problem or not. Hi, I'm Matthias from Option B. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was reading actually what was a Twitter thread that was pretend presenting some literature on this topic, um, and it was about the Gilets and I found it quite interesting because what they were saying, I'm sure you're aware of the literature. I just read it like from the from Twitter, but what they said, what they presented was basically like climate change as a kind of fourth claimant over the income of the society. So kind of what we can call. I don't know, maybe imports on a model 
Uh, so they, I mean, we have wages, profits, well, maybe bankers in your model, and like climate change as a fourth claimant. And what they were saying is basically, well, going back to the idea of tensions that you were mentioning before, like we cannot uh, give this income, this reduction in income to climate change at expense only of wages, because we see this kind of proxy conflicts uh, like the Chilechon was. So I found it very interesting, but I'm not really an expert on the topic, mm. so I would like what you think about like the possibility of modeling climate change as a claimant over income, first of all, and second, the emergence of these proxy conflicts. I think you mentioned something before. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, all very interesting questions. Um, so I think that the transition is more about, it's more than just a redefining of the structure of the production process. So it is also about that, but it's also about a different um, way to consume. I mean, if you go back to his question with, uh, is this a production uh, HD, um, footprint or a consumption footprint? I think the consumption pattern has to change. So it's not only about how do we make sure that we produce stuff in a greener way, it's also about how do we make sure that we consume in a sustainable way. And so it goes both ways. And that's why I'm really reluctant to say, okay, it's only public sector that has to do something. It's actually everyone has to move. And it's, this is the idea of the HDI footprint. It's, it's every country, but within a country, everyone has to move. It's, um, so so uh, what I can tell you is that most of the analysis I've seen in terms of labor content tend to show that uh, the transition is more labor intensive. Actually, ha sorry, no, it's, it actually has a more is a higher labor content in the production process, either because it's more labor intensive or because it depends on different wage structure, or it's because it's more locally produced and so you have less outflow or imports in in the content. Um, that's what I've seen. Uh, no, it, it might depend and so on. I, it's difficult for me to say what the structure, the production process will look like in the future. What I can tell you is most of the uh, scenarios that tend to a two degree scenario. So you have like all the, the big agencies build a two degree scenarios and they all tend to show that CCS, carbon capture and storage, is playing an important role to reach two degrees, which we don't have the technology for. So I know what it won't look like. I don't know how it will look like. <laughs> um, why do I think it's important as a heterodox to work on, on these supply driven constraints? First of all, it's because I think that the notion of uh, mainstream is we are in the optimum and we only look at how do we move, uh, how do we react away from the optimum to go back to the optimum. I don't think the optimum exists and that's the idea of this model is there are many different steady states which might emerge and the holy grail, the Solovian equilibrium is one of them but you might well be on another one and as soon as you accept this then the whole cost benefit analysis just completely disappears, vanishes, right? You, you can't say my cost is I'm away from the optimum because you're never on the optimum. So how do you measure your cost then? So it changes the way in which you think. So I think it is important to have this kind of, um, it's non-optimizing behavior, right? So, so that doesn't mean you can't evaluate two different scenarios and say, okay, this one is more costly in terms of employment, in terms of whatnot. But the, 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 I, the, the process to which away from the optimum, you go back to the optimum, is fundamental to the mainstream. And I don't, I, I don't think it's relevant in this kind of dynamics. Um, inventories, we need inventories. Why do we have inventories? Is because you need the proper accounting framework. So, so um, if you don't account for inventories, then it's difficult to explain the adaptation process to this equilibrium in the goods market. Is this relevant for um, agriculture-led uh, um, uh, industries or, or countries, actually it is and it is not, right? So you, uh, th there is a lot of questions about inventories and the, s the acyclicality of the production process in the market. So there's a lot of interesting questions which are related to what happens when you produce when prices are low and you have to borrow when prices are high. So inventories in that case is interesting. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm just pushing the argument forward, right? So I'm trying to dig myself out of the mud that you throw me in, but uh, <laughs> no, but it, so, so you, you, you're right. It's there because it, it is mostly for the accounting uh, issue. It doesn't mean that it doesn't play an important role and it is important. I think it's an important indicator for the state of the economic affairs. So it is worth having it. 
uh, but they are more, I mean, it is peanuts, it's, it's a few days. Uh, ah, interesting question. But it relates also to his, to his point. My fear of seeing climate change as an outflow is a bit related to the fact that any response to climate change drags you away from the optimum. And then you see the transition as an outflow. Because then the idea is you have your optimal production process. A chunk of it is lost because you are not on the optimal, because you are doing green policies. And then you distribute the rest. But that chunk, I still need to be proven that it exists. I, I, I honestly don't buy it. Because, because we're never on the optimum. So any policy, implement, any investment policy, any industrial policy will have a cost. Of course, there's going to be investment so on, but it's a recipient for someone else. The, that's the, and that's the, that's the nasty part of this mainstream approach is that, is there a chunk, chalk, sorry, just because it's interesting. So, so you have your optimum GDP, and then you say, well, this is, uh, this is the, the optimum, and this is uh, the green one, okay? And then I distribute my thing into, into, uh, into my three bits. That bit here is a cost for the entire economy, but it's a, it's a recipient for no one else. These things here are cost and income. This one is just a pure loss. And uh, as such, then the green transition is always negative. While I, I like the idea of class struggle because if climate change is part of the imbalance, and this is the idea of, the, of the, the coping with the collapse, where you have an imbalance on the ecological foot, on the, ecolog on the climate uh, idea, and then this has repercussion in the distribution of income among the different classes, sure. But, but that thing here, I mean, can, can you show me this is actually the case? Can we talk about loss of potential GDP where we never, we are never there? I, I need to be proven that we are currently there, and then damages. Then, then no, damage. It's more about the second approach you mentioned, like you have a kind of a, not necessarily, not necessarily on the optimal path. You yeah. Be on a demand path. Oh, mm. He wanted the, the mic. <laughs> Okay, thank you. No, I was, not, I was not necessarily talking about an optimal path, just the regular path where you have an extra claimant. Right, I mean, exactly. Then, 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 okay, yeah, sure. so it then, yeah, do you have more imbalances? Yeah, 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 that's yeah. the idea. I, I mean, in the supply-driven version of the model, this mm -hmm. shrinks. And so uh, what mm -hmm. you can see is that the distribution of income among bank, uh, workers, uh, bankers, and, 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 and mm -hmm. entrepreneurs then disappears or changes. Yeah, it changed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Hi, thank you for being here and, and presenting an interesting topic. Uh, my name is Sophie and I'm from Option A, which is the Knowledge and Innovation Policies. Right. Uh, so my question will not be about modeling, uh, <laughs> however it will be about these uh, more uh, progressive policies that you mentioned mm, to absorb these uh, social conflicts and make a consensus. And so other than this uh, commons uh, you know, option that you mentioned, uh, how do you propose this? Is it through, um, I mean, more directive, uh, by funding, proposing what uh, firms or people should uh, buy or invest in, or is it more to justify certain changes? Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Hannah, I'm from Option B. Um, my question is actually quite related to hers. Um, I wondered uh, about your work at the AFD, what that you're saying you also make <coughs> models for certain countries. And based on this model, you're saying that the public sector is very important. So I wonder if you could actually tell us what you advise countries or hypothetically <laughs> advise countries to do, what, what the role of the public sector is, and if they should in influence on what level um, this trans transition on the household level or firm basis or into what sectors they should actually go to. So more li like your policy advices. Yes, just a question about the, okay, one of the scenario is a, a scenario of collapse. Uh, and um, I, I just wonder whether in your institution, the scenario is really taken into account and to what extent it produces some change in the way the institution invests, makes some choices. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
in terms of the progressive policies, um, the one I think of is usually the one that try to combine social protection or social cohesion and environmental protection. So the PSNP is a very good example of that. Um, but there are others uh, where the idea is, uh, it's all related to the fact that a more equal society, society is a more resilient society to climate change. So you, you, there is less adaptation issue. Uh, and a more resilient society is usually less impactful on the environment. So everything that tries to combine these uh, will do. I, I, it's difficult to have lo lots of examples because usually there, there, there is little. Um, um, which brings back also to, my, to your question. So, so I usually talk to macroeconomists, which are related to the finance, finance ministry, sometimes central banks, um, maybe the energy ministry. So I don't have, and this is, this is um, so first of all, as I said, I'm a macroeconomist, so I don't, I don't have a wide knowledge about social um, policies in general, social protection. I work with a colleague of mine which, who's an expert and she's much more knowledgeable than I am. Um, but the kind of policy that I, I try to show is showing how transition have these co-benefits, for example, in terms of trade balance, in terms of limitation of the, f uh, the damage risks, um, limitation of stranded assets, uh, stranded jobs. So, so they show that if you anticipate the transition, not only is it creating some sectors, but also it's limiting some of the risks that are related to climate change. Um, that is not to say it's easy. And as I said, uh, in many countries, especially recently, it's much more complicated to talk about climate change because they are, well, the general consensus is you have Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, but many others around uh, in the world. Um, Europe is, is also going, I mean, I'm from Belgium, and Belgium was actually voting against the uh, ambitious, ambitious European plan. Um, so, so there's many cases where you can see that there's a general, as long as it doesn't impact growth or production, yeah, fine, you go and play with the hippies, but, but in, in, sorry. <laughs> But, but in practice, it's, it's difficult. There are examples of co-benefits. And I mentioned informality. Uh, there are impacts in terms of inflation for central banks, mm -hmm. in terms of trade balance. So there are examples. But it's, 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 we're still building the, con the, the discussion. So I didn't really answer your question. But ILO 2018, the World Employment Social Outlook, has a l two chapters on these kind of questions, both on the legal front and on on the active uh, social protection uh, policies, but that's that's I'm, I'm, I don't feel legitimate to talk a lot about it. Collapse. Um, so interestingly, I have had questions. Not only so, Gael Giraud, uh, the chief economist, is of course uh, someone. I don't know if you've heard about it, but but the chief economist of AFD is uh, a big defender of the potential of collapse. But outside of him. <laughs> I've had questions about the, the, is it possible to have collapse? Not necessarily about financial collapse, uh, but about collapse in terms of uh, natural resources, in terms of environment, in terms of uh, biodiversity and so on. And it is a question that is emerging right now, which is what is the, what is the um, development model that we want to push forward? And is the development model what we want to push forward in sync with these questions of potential collapse? I, I don't think there's an answer. Um, but the f and so on the financial side, um, I forgot the name of the law. I think it's law 173, which forces any financial institution to incorporate uh, damage, uh, 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 climate risks into the portfolio. So AFD is going through the entire portfolio of financial assets and looking, is there any risk of climatic damage to it? But that's on only on the, and that's all the banks, uh, all the financial institutions in France have to do that. Um, so it is part of the answer, right? Well, thank you very much for this really great presentation.